name is Jordan Kelsey. I'm the president of Get Your Own Bowl on campus. Um, so excited to have you guys here. Thanks for coming. Um, huge crowd. Um, but first, I'd like to thank the university for hosting this event. I'd also like to thank Ani and the Youth for Paul staff. Uh, probably me plan this event. Um, that feel for a lot of red tape, so them helping me out is just terrific. I hate doing the red tape. I'm so grateful for what they did. Um, I'd like to thank my Youth for Ron Paul group. Uh, So thank you guys so much. It's amazing. Um, I couldn't have done this without you guys. You're so terrific. Uh, just thank you so much. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Rod Paul for so much. Um, you inspired so many of us, so many people my age, to get active and come politically aware and even read books on the Federal Reserve. <laughs> and you've inspired an enthusiasm that no other candidate could even dream of as you just heard. with your consistency, your willingness to stand on principle, even when it's unpopular, and most importantly, with your message of individual liberty. That is why I'm so honored to welcome you to the University of Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Paul. I really appreciate this. Uh, Jordan, he had, Jordan said if I came over, he had a few friends. He'd get them all out there. There you go. It's, it's great to see so much uh, enthusiasm for the cause of liberty. We certainly need it. We need it in Washington is where we really need it. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of things going on in this country, and there's a lot of good things going on. Coming out like this, a young crowd like this, enthusiastic about an issue which is so important, which has been forgotten for many decades, that's a good reason to cheer, and I applaud you for your interest in this very... <laughs> You know, I, I get asked a lot of times by the media uh, exactly why why are the young people interested in what I've been talking about. I said, well, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is uh, they're they're getting a bad deal. <laughs> you're, you're inheriting a mess. And you you have a big debt to deal with. You have perpetual wars that never seem to end. But for various reasons, the Federal Reserve is an issue. Personal liberty is an issue. The ongoing wars. And also this, this deficit, uh, and, and it's a lot, of, a lot of problems. And I think it came together about four or five years ago when it was recognized with the financial crisis how serious this was. But also, we're winning these arguments. We're winning these arguments uh, certainly, certainly on, on the Federal Reserve. Just think, you know, it's been around for 100 years, and this is the first time we've had a serious debate about whether it even should exist. And last year, we actually, uh, you know, got a, a Federal Reserve audit passed in the House. We got a partial audit, audit passed. And, and this is a reflection of people like you who have gotten to your congressmen and the congresswomen and said, hey, look, why don't you support this? So the majority is switching and changing. But even on the war issue, this is one where we're winning, too. It's been neglected for so long. But now 69% of the American people say enough is enough. Get out of Afghanistan. Yeah, they have 
because why are we having trouble paying our bills? Why are we having trouble, you know, with uh, taking care of people's medical problems and our educational well, system? We, in the last 10 years, we have increased our national debt by $4 trillion for fighting wars that are undeclared. <laughs> and, you know, it wouldn't be too difficult to figure out the solution to this. What if we just have, have a daydream for a minute? What if we had all those people in Washington who actually read the Constitution? And read the you know, in those circumstances, we wouldn't have had a war since World War II. The nations would probably have a lot more friends, too. <laughs> Unfortunately, the foreign policy you're inheriting, and I hope uh, we, we do see these changes, is one where our country goes and we have this belief that we have this responsibility to be the policeman on the world. And we go to the various dictators and we say, if you'll be our pet dictator, we're going to give you billions of dollars. But if you don't, we're going to give you a lot of bombs on your country and we're going to kill your people. What a choice. What about a choice? What about a choice of talking to people, being friends with people, and trade with people? This whole thing about it, it's been going on for a hundred years. I actually started with Woodrow Wilson. We had this obligation, <laughs> this obligation to uh, uh, spread our, our uh, excellence around the world because we're supposed to be an exceptional nation. In many ways we are. But how do you prove that you're an exceptional nation by bombing people when they haven't <laughs> even attacked us? That's not true. But the, and our, high, our quality that we have and that we're losing and we need to restore I mean, if we truly protected civil liberties, if we truly had a sound monetary system and we knew how to uh, provide the conditions for a free market economy and sound money and a foreign policy of friendship and trade, I mean, if we'd set an example, wouldn't this be a better way to spread our message through those who would want to emulate what we're doing if we set a good yeah. standard for the rest of the world? think about what happened in the 1960s because that was when I had finished medical school and, and uh, I was drafted during the Cuban crisis and not only was there the Cuban crisis there was also the Vietnam War going on. Well the French were there for 10 years, we went there 10 years, we lost 60,000 personnel, we, we spent a lot of money which ushered in a decade of the 70s of a very bad economic climate. But finally when we leave, what happened? Was there a domino effect and the whole world became communist? No, communist was a failed system. It fell apart. Right now, you know, the Chinese have become our banker. And, uh, and now the Vietnamese, we visit there, we trade there, we invest over there, and they come over here. Just think in the time after the war was over, what was achieved in peace that was never achieved in 20 years of a war. There's no way you can expect war to solve the problem. There's another thing that you'll read about, and sometimes you're taught these things, but it's an absolute fallacy that war of a society that destroys its currency, and believe me, there's been plenty throughout the ages. When you destroy the currency by debasing the currency, printing the money, diluting the metal, or whatever, or using a computer, when you debase the currency, you destroy the middle class and the wealthy get wealthier. There's a transfer of wealth automatically from the middle class and the poor to the wealthy. That is what's happening, and that's why there's a lot of, a lot of uh, dissent right now and a lot of people very angry and upset because the middle class is shrinking. It's poorer now than it used to be. We, we used to have the largest and the richest middle class in the history of the whole world. But today, the wealth that you see that still exists in the middle class is uh, based on death. So it's a fiction that the wealth is still there. And the middle class now is threatened because of this economic system. So whether you're spending, wasting money overseas or whether you're debasing the currency or having the government spend the money instead of the people spend the money, you're going to end up with a mess like this. This is the reason I make a suggestion for my first year in office to cut spending by the government by $1 trillion.
what we could do is stop uh, some of these this construction works overseas. For instance, one good example of a, of a real wasteful project, we're spending nearly a billion dollars building the biggest embassy in the history of the world. The biggest one for, in Baghdad. <laughs> I'll they tell you the war is over in Iraq, believe me, it is. They, they're, they, they're going to have 17,000 employees uh, in, in, this, uh, in this embassy, which is going to be about the same size as, as, the, um, uh, as the embassy in, in Italy. Uh, but what, uh, what, what are they going to do is now to maintain that embassy, they just appropriated another $5 billion. Why, why don't we spend this money home? Cut the taxes, let you spend it. The government, let me tell you one thing. I, uh, <laughs> I've met a couple bureaucrats and a few politicians in the time I've been in Washington. And let me tell you, they're not smart enough to know how to spend your money. I tell you, you people worry. He's going to cut a trillion dollars out of budget. No, we're not cutting a trillion dollars out of the spending, which is transferring the responsibility of the spending to the people rather than the government. That's it. We've, we've embarked on these problems uh, for a hundred years. This is, uh, this is when we got careless, especially that Woodrow Wilson era. <laughs> that, was, that was a bad era. Not only did he uh, come up with this uh, newfangled foreign policy about making the world safe for democracy, he's also the one that in introduced this notion or had passed this notion of the income tax. <laughs> Income tax is a, a vicious tax. It bases, it's based on the fact that you endorse the idea that government owns all your income and the government allows you to keep a certain percentage on their conditions. This is why the founders didn't give us an income tax. In a true republic, if we, when, when you see the restoration of the republic, you will see the repeal of the 16th Amendment. <laughs> Yeah, we ought to have a celebration, you know, uh, that Federal Reserve System is going to be 100 years old, so uh, <laughs> what, we do is, uh, what we should do is have a bill that repeals the Federal Reserve Act on it. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve uh, has to be challenged for economic reasons, for moral reasons, as well as constitutional reasons, and also because it causes governments to grow. But the moral reason is very simple. They, they're the counterfeiters. They counterfeit money. Yeah. So the founders didn't like counterfeiters. They wanted us to have only gold and silver as legal tender, and then they had a, uh, a coinage act of 1792, and they said anybody who counterfeits the currency would get the death penalty. That's how serious they thought it was and how, how important that was. But they're the counterfeiters. They devalue the currency, and yet they, were, they have up until recently been held in very high esteem. But uh, the truth is, is they create the bubbles, and then uh, they, that sets the stage for the inevitable bust and, and the recessions and the depression, and then they delay the recovery, and this is what we're going through right now. But economically, it's a major, uh, a major problem for the business cycle. But also constitutionally, there's no authority for a central bank. It's not there. And, our, and this argument's been going on a long time. Jefferson and Hamilton had the argument. And, uh, and that would go back and forth. First yeah. Hamilton wins, and then Jefferson became president. He got rid of the National Bank. Yeah. It, it's been wow. I mean, it would be neat to have another president one day that got rid of this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. If the issue indeed is liberty, it means also that uh, the opposite of liberty is big government. The bigger the government is less liberty. It's just automatic that way. So if you think you can have big government and a lot of liberty, it's not the case. 
But the Federal Reserve enhances the growth of government. So if it's an entitlement system, uh, there's never enough taxes and never enough borrowing. So you have to print the money. And that delays the consequences and it hides the people who suffer the most. It hides the victims. So it's very tempting. The politicians love it. And they get away with it until there's a major crisis. And we're in the midst of that. And that's why things will have to change. But, but also, the, um, also the issue of war. Wars cannot be fought without inflation, and that is the, you know, the printing of money. So if we truly wanted to change our policies, we should do one thing that even if you can't get all the tax code changed and all the laws changed, you could do one thing to make the point. Get rid of the withholding tax. This is what would happen. If, if the businessman wasn't required to withhold your tax, uh, who he then becomes a tax collector, and of course you then have to participate, and if there's ever a challenge, you're guilty until you're proven innocent. It's totally unconstitutional the way, way it operates. But what if we as a people had to write a check every month to pay all the bills, we couldn't borrow the money, we couldn't print the money, and pay for the type of government we get. I think that it wouldn't last very long. <laughs> I think people would rebel and say, no, I'm not sending you any more money for what I'm not getting from the government. <laughs> But for politicians, deception is, is overly tempting, and uh, they yield to the temptation of the money. And, and uh, you have to admit, for a long time, it sort of worked for the favor of the politician, because they can go and promise whatever they want, and they can borrow the money. And we were so wealthy, and, uh, and uh, we were able to do it for a long time. But things have changed now. The wealth is gone. The, 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 control, the control now is on special interests. Uh, we, we don't endorse the principle of, of liberty and earning and allowed to keep what you earn, what we have endorsed is that the government's responsible for redistribution of wealth and to manage our lives and manage the world. And that is exactly opposite of what a free society is, is all about. But if we, if we continue to do this, uh, the country will, will go totally bankrupt. It's technically uh, bankrupt right now, but it will go bankrupt, and that's when you'll see the destruction uh, of, of the currency. But we're approaching that uh, rather, rather quickly. And if, uh, if we continue to do this, we'll see more and more power. The argument in Washington, the argument in the campaigns, isn't so much liberty versus big government. Unfortunately, my goal, of course, is to take the position that it should be the contest between liberty and big government. That's what the campaign is. So what, what is going on is a, it's a fight over special interests of one party versus the special interests of the other party, and they're clawing away at a pie that is shrinking. And that's why people are getting very, very nervous, and that's why you should be very concerned, because this is not going to last. I used to talk a whole lot about we have to quit the spending, because we don't have the right to uh, put this uh, debt on the next generation. That isn't true, because it's this generation, it's you right now, you're getting ready to get out of school, and you have debt, and the government has debt, and its obligations are endless. It's right now, we're all seeing the consequence of the last 50, 60, 70 years of excessive spending, deficit financing, mischief with the currency, and adapting. You know, I thought it would be so wonderful when the Cold War ended, we get a peace deal. Fortunately, it didn't happen. The neoconservatives took over, and they decided we had to be the policemen of the world. To get back to where we were, we of course have to change our foreign policy. We have to look at the Federal Reserve, have a different monetary policy, and we have to further understand how free markets work. This whole idea, I know many people are motivated, and, and most of the people in Washington are well motivated to take care of people and don't let anybody fall through the cracks. But that's also the same motivation to run your personal life. They say, well, people aren't smart enough to know what they should do with their own habits, so we have to tell them to regulate their lives. Then we also have to regulate how they spend their money. But they're well motivated because they think that uh, the people won't take care of themselves. This is what motivated the housing bubble. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, easy credit, people can get loans, and this sounds wonderful. Everybody deserves to have a house. Everybody deserves to be free, but not everybody deserves a house but at the expense of somebody else. Uh, you, you should have to work for them. <laughs> Easy 
credit seemed to be helping. People were getting their houses, and then we had these government programs and forced banks to make bad loans. And they were wondering why, why this thing was uh, coming about, because it was helping a lot of people. At the same time, they had this tremendous edge, the price of the house, the value of the house was going up and up. So you kept borrowing against it, and uh, they refused. If you, talk, uh, if you look at all of the reports of uh, both Greenspan and Bernanke, they never once said, that they reassured everybody, oh, there's no problem, no problem at all, there's no, no, no but what, but what happens? There was a lot of people making some big money on that. You know, we had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the big bank. And but this incentive to help poor people get a house, even though well motivated, was a disaster. Because guess what? The bubble burst and the crisis hit. And people ran back to Washington. And I remember in 08, both presidential candidates ran back to vote for the bailouts. And guess who got bailed out? The very rich who were making all the money in the process. The much rich. Oh! Bankruptcy with the derivatives market, and they get the bailout. And what happened to the middle class? What happened to the people who were supposed to get the house? They lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So the entitlement system doesn't work. You should be entitled to your life. You should be entitled to your liberty, and you ought to be entitled to keep what you earn. Woo! 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 So I often think that we've lost, as a people, we've lost our confidence how the market works. And we've accepted a few notions that I think are completely wrong. Uh, one is that uh, too many people accept the idea that the government can protect us against ourselves. You can't do that. I mean, you embark on the worst kind of government. It's the worst authoritarian government. And if you can't take care of yourself economically, then you have to have the nanny state taking care of us. But also, if you can't protect, if, if the government uh, can protect you against yourself, that means they want to regulate every personal habit that you have. Yeah. And, uh, and it is true when you have total freedom. Uh, some people are going to misuse that freedom. And sometimes they're going to do things that you're not going to like. But the whole thing is, is if you let the government make those decisions, when they make a mistake, they make them all for everybody. In a free society, you make a mistake, you make it for yourself, and you ought to suffer the consequences. Woo! Yeah. I think we understand that issue pretty well when it comes to religious beliefs. We can uh, have no religious beliefs, or we can have various religions, and we fairly, you know, tolerate that fairly well, as well as intellectual activities. We're allowed to still read uh, books about communism and socialism and all these failed policies, and we don't regulate that. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, we've come up with this idea that we're allowed to regulate what goes into our souls and into our brains, but we're not allowed to regulate the what goes into our body. <laughs> I mean, you ought to make your decisions what goes into your body. a good idea, and I would even allow you to drink raw milk if you wanted to. <laughs> the one thing that you're inheriting is a country that thinks they can solve all the problems. If you have a debt problem, you have more debt. If you have a spending problem, you spend more money. If you have a printing press problem, you print more money. But, uh, <laughs> this, whole, this whole thing, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. It makes things worse. And this is why, uh, I mean, you're, we'll have to make these decisions rather, uh, rather quickly. But, uh, you know, on, in the personal liberty issue, I think this is probably one of the most serious things because it seems to be ignored. Uh, after 9-11, uh, which was a horrible day in our history, but I think because there has been a lot of misunderstanding exactly what happened, I don't happen to believe that we were attacked because we're free and prosperous. I, I, don't, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's, that's the case. But anyway, there were a lot of things on the books that they were trying to do. They had been itching to go to war against Iraq. It was their excuse to go to Iraq. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. They had no weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> What I would be 
bill that they have floating around, they had been trying to pass it for years, it was called the Patriot Act. <laughs> That passed rather easily because it was under the circumstances. I had one member of Congress tell me, well, I have to pay vote for it. And I said, do you know any, what's in it? No, I don't know what's in it. And I said, you know, there's going to be bad stuff in there. He said, yeah, I know that. He says, but how, how can I vote against the Patriot Act a couple days after 9-11? He, he said, he said, uh, he said, how am I going to go back home and explain that to my constituents? I said, that's your job. Go home and explain it to them. If they would have called, if they would have called that bill repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, maybe they wouldn't have had so darn many votes for it. So when we get rid of the Patriot Act, we're going to call the bill restore the Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment. You know, there's a lot more going on. Not only has it been the Patriot Act, which means that the people who are wanting to search our houses and our internet and all can do it with the, the people doing the searching can write their own search warrants. You don't have to go to a judge anymore. But it, it's even it's even gotten worse than that. You know, the National Defense Authorization Act. Bad. This is literally saying that the uh, that the, that the military can come in now and uh, arrest people and have have no charges made, no attorney, and can be put in a secret prison indefinitely. That is not American. That's terrible. <laughs> The other day, uh, Obama uh, Obama wrote an executive order. Well, we can bring the, the principal of the executive order as well. As a president, the president of constitutional president can repeal all the bad executive orders with another executive order. Now, there's the, a Defense Production Act that's been on the books and in time of war, the president can take over everything. The whole economy, can socialize the whole economy and the banking system and everything. But this time it was renewed by executive order just a couple weeks ago, and he added this thing, not in times of war, but he can do it in times of peace as well. I just wonder what, what, the, what, the, what the plan is uh, that's going on. But one thing that is good is a lot of people are waking up. There's not uh, enough of people awake in Washington, but there are a lot of you are waking up. Not only have you awakened uh, with uh, regard to the Federal Reserve and all, but you know, uh, when, when you heard about, uh, you know, Stop Online Piracy Act, guess what? A lot of people called their congressmen. They took those off the dock and they're not even working on them. So, as bad as, bad as it is, uh, it still works. The system can work. Uh, it's just that we have been inundated with bad philosophy, bad economic philosophy, and loss of confidence in the true free society. But when the people wake up, it will work. And this is what's so exciting about talking to so many young people across the country. And the enthusiasm isn't just spotty. It's wherever I go, people like you are very interested. You're understanding that there are problems. And it's not, it's just not picking and choosing the special interest. It's structural. It's philosophic. This is what has to be changed. You know, we're, we're working hard, uh, at least pretending, <laughs> in, in, in Washington on, on the budget. But, you know, the crisis is not a budgetary crisis. The budget is the symptom of the crisis of us understanding what the role of government ought to be. The role of government is what yeah. policy should not be to be the policeman of the world. And that's what yeah. The government shouldn't be the nanny state and taking care of everybody from cradle to grave and bankrupting the country and put in programs that don't work. So it's the role of government that has to be addressed, and then the budget comes into place. But it's, a, it's not technically a budgetary problem because the tinkering that they do is just uh, unbelievably minor. Today, uh, I mean, uh, yes, uh, today we're working on the budget, and the proposal is on the Republican side, the conservative budget is... Uh, 
uh, you know, to cut proposed increases, but not to cut any spending, just to propose increases. It, it actually increases the military spending because that's the part. But, but don't worry, balance the budget. For 30 years. <laughs> So I, I think the problems are very obvious. I, I think the crisis is at our doorstep, but the enthusiasm for change is there. It has to be done. It will be done. Even if we don't change things with the Federal Reserve in a calm, deliberate fashion, the system is going to uh, collapse itself because they end up destroying the money. But we, uh, we, should, we should be very optimistic that we can accomplish this because the people are responding in a very favorable way. But we also have to change a couple attitudes. So often, I'm sure some of you have been accused of this, that you just want to go back to the dark ages. You want to go back to the dark ages, back to the Constitution. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Back to these dark ages. But you know where the dark ages are. They endorse tyranny. That's where the dark ages are. Freedom is a new idea, relatively speaking, in history has been really tested best in this country, and we've sort of given up on this. So we don't want to go back. What we want to do is pick up the pieces where they were and improve on it. We can have a better gold standard. We can have a better understanding of individual <laughs> We certainly can have a better understanding, or at least improve on what the founders advised about a foreign policy of uh, non-intervention and friendship and trade. I think, for instance, uh, that we ought to admit that sanctions don't work. Sanctions cause sanctions are actually an act of war. So whether it's sanctions against the Iranians or, or sanctions against Cuba, they think it's about time we started talking to the Cubans and going. To The Castro's are still living down there, and after 40-some years, they've used us as a scapegoat and blamed us for all the problems. So there, there's so many things that we can improve upon and pick up the pieces. But bringing the, with the principles of liberty and this whole idea of freedom is such a wonderful answer to our problems because everybody should endorse freedom, whether you're left, right, middle, conservative, or What it does is it, it invites the answers to our problems because we do have diversity. We have diversity in religion. So the diversity of how you're going to use your freedom is so important. You know, if you use it one way, but the one thing it takes is tolerance of others. If they do things that you don't like and uh, you can't say, oh, that's terrible. We have to have a law against that because I don't like what they're doing. As long as, as, long as you don't hurt other people and mind your own business, it would work. In many ways, this in many ways brings coalitions together. It brings uh, brings left and right together on civil liberties and war, and uh, even on the spending policies. It, it should bring us all together. Uh, in Washington, and even today, and you know, lately in the last few weeks, I've been getting a lot of uh, a lot of suggestions, a lot of advice from the media and from other people. <laughs> they, keep saying, they keep saying, "When are you going to drop out of this?" When are, you, when are you going to quit being overly rigid? When are you going to start compromising? My, my answer to that is there's been way too much compromising for way too long. Because that's exactly what they do. The leadership of both parties compromise, and they have the same foreign policy, they have the same monetary policy, they have the same spending policy, they have the same entitlement system, and they say and they endorse this whole principle of lobbyists running the show and and fighting for their piece of the pie. So what we need really is actually less compromise. We need coalition building. We need to bring people together. I believe our constitution and the principle of liberty will bring us together. And. Uh, and if, if we accept these basic principles of, of more tolerance for other people, just remember, tolerance doesn't mean endorsement. You know, I happen to think, for instance, that the drug war is totally useless. And I think, 
I think it's been used to abuse our liberties and all, but I also think that drugs are very bad. But I also believe that if people make those decisions, but when you do this because somebody might misuse the drugs, then all of a sudden we have this argument about using medicinal marijuana, then we have, uh, if we have courts, the Supreme Court comes up and say, oh, we have a right to regulate that under interstate commerce to, because you can't raise marijuana in your backyard to take care of So these are the kind of things that people have to make up their own mind. I can have my opinion. I advise everybody. I advise my children and grandchildren that drugs are very dangerous, and we should recognize that. But to make up your own minds about this is, um, is, is your business. You have to tell them about it. But if you look at the uh, consequences of the drug war, it's a disaster. It's a, it's a trillion dollar deficit. Uh, I think over the 20, 30 years, it's like $3 trillion of debt that has accumulated. And because of our laws this year, on January 1st, uh, our country issued, uh, ushered in 46,000 new laws. That's, not, that's too many. <laughs> what I'd like to do is repeal 46,000 laws. We can do that, we must do that, uh, but we have to restore this, this confidence that we need. And, and this, is, this is actually where we're making uh, tremendous progress. Uh, what we need to do is be, continue to be energized. We each have a responsibility. If, if you endorse what I say and understand it, you know, you're going to be in a... In uh, but, 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 the, but I don't think it takes sacrifice. It takes work, but not sacrifice. People say, oh, to get over this, we have to sacrifice. If I return your liberty to you and give you the chance to work hard and keep what you earn, get the government out of your life, out of your wallet, out of your bedroom, and leave you alone, that's not a with less people in prison because we have too many laws. We have 5% of the population of the world with 25% of the prisoners. There's something messed up. I think, I think it's because we have way too many laws is what I think the problem is. But, you know, uh, but the tests were there and we saw the results and then we, our country has given up on it. But right now, I think we're on the verge of making a better decision. And this is the reason we should be optimistic and we should be very positive and, and take upon yourself to do something about it. A lot of people after we, I speak, they'll come out and say, what should I do, what should I do? Do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Some people run for office. Some people even get elected to office. Some people have other people run for office. Some people are, uh, are pretty good at earning money and they donate to other causes. Some te people become teachers. Some people actually go into journalism. I'd like to see a lot more freedom lovers going to journalism. And there is a job uh, for each and every every one of us. And uh, and one thing with certainty, you know, when an idea's time has come, it can't be stopped. And, and, and the ideas of liberty have been around, but they've been lying dormant. I think your generation is awakening a lot of people, not only your generation, but a lot of other people who have been holding back and looking for a little uh, uh, encouragement. But, you know, they say that armies can't stop it. I think they can stop individuals at times, and they can put roadblocks in front of a few politicians. But the idea is they cannot stop. It is the idea... <laughs> the revolution is truly successful, it will not be a partisan issue. It will not be a Republican issue. Just as the problems in Washington is the compromising and this coalition building in Washington of right and left doing the wrong things, when the time comes when there is the coalition of individuals coming together and the revolution is successful, it will be by ideological and it will be pervasive and it will spread through the nation. It is already starting. It's growing. And 
that the goal ought to be peace and prosperity, and this is the way we seek peace and prosperity. If we want in our personal lives to, to seek virtue and excellence, which I think is a pretty good idea, you can't do it with the government telling you what to do. If the government wants to make you virtuous and excellent and, and wealthy and all this, all they do is undermine our liberties. And this is the reason that the free society is the best society. And it's the only humanitarian society. Yeah. The politicians who say that we're going to have forced redistribution of wealth and give houses, free houses, and all this, and free food to everybody. They, <laughs> they do this and make us look like we're not humanitarian. We don't care about our fellow man. The truth is, if you're a humanitarian, you care about your fellow man, you care about prosperity, you care about correcting the problems of starvation, you have to believe in liberty, the free market, and sound money. That will produce our peace and prosperity that we all desire. Thank you.